So if you think about the different imaging technologies that we have with conventional radiographs, regular CTs, weight-bearing CT is unique because it can really give us some, a, a real picture of what's happening. Um, so you put it in this spectrum and it has its place. It's, what it allows us to do is we're looking at a highly complex anatomic and biomechanical structure when you're looking at the foot, 28 bones, Mohs of 3D, a maze of 3D architecture depending upon how you load it, it's subject to acute and chronic structural changes with repeated stress. So it's very unique in terms of its function. So understanding how these structures react under stress is going to help us in terms of understanding the pathology that we treat. And it gives us certainly a lot of uh, more information than 2D radiographs, which have their inherent limitations. And really, why do we need to consider weight bearing? Well, the real thing is the angles and distances that we measure on regular x-rays really don't co correlate accurately to what we actually see in the real patient. So if you look at standard CT and you combine it with x-rays, you can get more information. Um, but it requires a high radiation dose. Uh, you have the absence of weight bearing on the CT, especially um, it gives you false information. You have to make a lot of assumptions. So it leads to poor reproducibility in the measurements that you have, and the reliability isn't very good. It's also extremely time consuming when you try to do this process. Really good articles uh, that were done by Alexei Barg summarize the limitations as well as a lot of the things that we're doing with CT in terms of weight bearing. And partial weight bearing potentially underestimates the impact of load. So you have to make assumptions. Passive external loads underestimate the actions of the muscles because there's always a reaction and, and to that load. Um, and the apparatus in most of these studies is custom made, it's very cumbersome, and it really doesn't reproduce the reality. So what ends up happening is you have issues. You can't get reproducibility of the measurements and the validity of the image. So you know, if you think about these studies, you're looking at intra-observer reliability as well as intra-observer reliability. And those are the things that you want to try to validate in these studies. And if the measurement that is repeated on the image doesn't give you an accurate picture of the reality to begin with, even if it's a great measurement in terms of its reproducibility, all you're doing is reproducing the error. And that's one of the problems that we have when we try to make these assumptions from taking standing films and combining it with x-rays, or with uh, regular CT. So the real question is not whether the measurement's good enough, but is it the right measurement, all right? Does the image really give you what you're trying to find out? And that's really what the problem is. So if you look at a single patient to get that, you have to do multiple exposures, and even with that, the result can be invalid. So where has this been looked at? It's been looked at in cadaver studies, and again, something as simple as if you, if you look at this one, say a 30 degree, and you took 30 degrees of rotation produces a, a rotation of 30% of in Miri's angle. So what that means is if you do this and you try to correlate this, your accuracy rate is going to be about 72%. So if you start out with 1,000 patients and you're going to use this technique to validate, you're going to be wrong 280 of the 1,000 patients. That's a big error, all right? So we got to try to do better. Well, what happens with weight-bearing CTs, you get a lot more information, and you've got to figure out how to process all that information. And right now, it means that's a lot more time for interpretation. And the other thing is that it's going to potentially invalidate what we take to be the existing truth based on what we've observed on 2D measurements. So there's a weight-bearing CT international study group. Alistair is part of this, I believe. Um, and it's really its goals are really to investigate the possibilities figure out how to validate new measuring systems, organize and focus the international research effort, and really produce common guidelines for the clinical use of weight-bearing CT. Um, so how is it done? Like most of you, have, you know, probably have seen these, but it's a cone beam with a rotating x-ray. Um, the center of the rotation is the object that you're investigating, and then the photon saucer is at one end of the diameter of the axis, and it goes around the target is at the other end, uh, and it's really kind of fascinating the technology to watch it work. The target is continuously projected on the photons that have traversed the object, and the result is this whole array, array of lines. It's called a sinogram. It then gets interpreted mathematically through the uh, platform that they have, and you get a Fournier, which is a reconstruction of that multiple simple sinus function in one complex one. Um, they call it a radon, and it reconstructs it in a 3D coordinates. All right, so this is, you know, you put down the machine, you do this. It takes about two minutes to do this whole process as opposed to a normal CT. It's really kind of fascinating. So the result is this three-dimensional cylind three cylinder of volume or field of view. And it varies in diameter between 1 and 40 centimeters in terms of what you can get. It's then divided into smaller cubes called voxels. So a voxel is kind of like on your phone, your 2D dimension, you have pixels on your pictures. Well, the voxel is the 3D uh, equivalent to that. And that's the best way to think about what you're getting. The side of each voxel is about 0.3 millimeters. All right? And the resolution depends on the density of the receptors in the target panel, but also on the software and the memory that you're using. 
So a typical voxel is going to contain hundreds of millions, a typical left field of view, rather, is going to contain 100 million voxels. And each one has four dimensions. So it's the typical x, y, and z that you think about. But it also has what's called a household unit, which is the density. And that's what allows you, if you look at some of these images, how you can change that. And you can get the skin, you can get the, the bone, you can change the quality of the bone, you can even see some of the tendons. The acquisition time is very quick. Um, and that voxel, is, this, the, the ability to uh, change that Hausman unit is what allows you to get these different images on the 3D reconstructions. And you can see skin in some of these. And it's really kind of fascinating technology. Radiation exposure is really interesting on this. So if you do a single foot x-ray, it's about two, um, uh, two millisieverts, which is the unit they use. If you do bilateral, it's about six millimeters. Daily exposure uh, and background is about eight. So you, know, you send somebody for an x-ray, it's about having them stay the, the day at the beach or go skiing in Vail. All right? Con conventional x-rays, about one. Chest x-rays, about two. Extremity CT is 25. All right, 25 to 100, so it's a lot more. When you do these exposures on, on the uh, standing weight-bearing CT scans, it's about six, so it's a big difference. This is the setup. It fits in a very small room, which is kind of cool. The amount of data that you get, though, is huge. It's much greater than you get on a, a two-dimensional one. So if you've got to figure that out, you've got to be really smart, and you've got to be willing to spend a fair amount of time doing it. Um, you look at a 2D, you can do your measurements probably in about five minutes, but if you're trying to do this on a, on a weight-bearing CT, it could take up to 20 minutes, which is really time we usually don't have. Um, so there are some machines that are coming with built-in software that are going to assist in this, and it helps you redu uh, reproduce this data and get the measurements that you want as we figure out what measurements we need to do. You can also get 2D radiographs off of this by taking selective uh, um, cuts. Uh, and so what some people will do is they'll have this unit in their, machine, in their office. They'll do essentially these scans on everybody because the radiation dose is about equivalent. And then they go ahead and do these measurements. The drawbacks is they're not quite as good. So what are the challenges? Basically what we have to do is figure out how to essentially switch from paper maps to satellite navigation. And that's what we're really doing as we're going into this technology. Um, so they're developing systems to do automatic, uh, automatic measurements. So it basically all gets done by computer. It may not make our decision making clinically any easier because it's going to give us a bunch more parameters to take into account and then we have to figure out what to do with them. These are the different areas that are being investigated by the study group. Um, flat foot, there's some interesting things that you're finding out. And what we're really learning is that the parameters that we've been measuring on, on regular x-rays may not be accurate. Um, Patients with a flat foot have more innate valgus in their tailor shape and their subsequent subtalar alignment. These are just some little points that have come out on the papers. Patients with flat feet, their fifth metatarsal demonstrates more plantar flexion relative to the first metatarsal. When you look at subtalar joint orientation, that may be a risk factor to the mental of ankle arthritis. All these things are little things that we're finding out. Looking at the internal rotation of the talus uh, and varus, maybe more in arthritic ankles. Um, and we have to figure out how to interpret all of this data as we get more and more of it. Um, and in comparison, generally comparing it to the contralateral side seems to be the most reliable way to do it. When we look at hallus rigidus, one of the things we're finding is more elevation as the severity progresses. We think it probably makes sense. In hallux valgus, we're looking at the mobility. And again, it may not be limited to the, to the MTP, but the tarsal metatarsal further joint may be following. So how, the big challenge is how are we going to measure all this? Um, I'm going to skip through this in the instance of time because it's just a little bit more of the technical part. Um, but the sort of the take home message, because I'm running out of time uh, on this thing, really is that what we're learning is that you have to think of this more in 3D, uh, in a 3D concept. Um, when you look at the hind foot alignment views that Tarly Saltzman described, we may find that that's not exactly the most accurate measurement because really what you have to do is look at the weight and the ground reaction force together. Um, instead of doing an indirect measurement, we're able to do more of a direct measurement with this. And this is what we're learning from these studies. Um, so you can take these weight-bearing scans and you can utilize all this. And what the study group is doing going forward is trying to interpret this whole new volume of data and figure out how to do this. We're probably going to end up with new parameters of measurement. We're going to have to go back and reconsider whether the things we're doing on plain x-rays really correlate to this as we go forward. Uh, it's really sort of fascinating uh, stuff. Uh, I want to just jump to the end of this because I'm running out of time. I know there's two articles that I would suggest that you look at um, that are really good review articles. Um, so this is the first one, and this is a systematic review of the literature, looking at weight-bearing CTNs, and these are both done by Alexi Barr. Um, and this will give you a really good understanding of the concept of how this stuff works 
and, and what the science is behind it. And then the second one is this is sort of done as a consensus article by this study group looking at where we're going in the future and what the possibilities are. Uh, I think it's, it's a fascinating technology. Uh, we're going to learn more and more about it as we go forward, and it's going to be interesting to see how, we imp how that impacts our clinical practice. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Keith. That's